If you have a Bible this morning, please turn to John chapter 17, and we're looking at verses 20 to 23. John chapter 17, verses 20 to 23. These are the words of Christ. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, so that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, And loved them, even as you loved me. Well, it's great this morning to continue with the high priestly prayer of Christ. Uh, To hear again what was on Jesus' heart just before the Garden of Gethsemane, just before that Garden of Tears and Bitterness. Uh, What was the Son of God thinking about? What was he praying about? And who was on his heart? All these things we see again and again in John chapter 17. Now, if you were here last week together with us, and we looked at three truths in the Word of God, and we saw firstly the truth that the Word of God has been given to men. We saw that in our passage, didn't it? Jesus said, I have given to them your Word. And the Bible makes the radical claim that the words we have in it are not just a collection of stories which can help you. They're not just a legends or myths or anything like that. These are the words of God, true in everything that they state and the words which we need to live by. As Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So the word of God has been given to men, but tragically, the word of God has been rejected by a great number of people. The word of God is hated by men, we saw in our passage. Jesus said, I've given, the, I've given them your word and the world has hated them for it. It's a reminder to us that not everybody likes the Bible and not everyone thinks it's the best of all books. And because it talks about human sin, because it, it puts its finger on us, because it reads us, people would not want to read it. Many people hate the word of God, push it to one side and try and ignore it as a fairy tale for adults. Even though God's given us his word, his word the world has hated us for it. And, but it wasn't all doom and gloom, was it? Yes, many people have hated the word of God, but many people have also received it. And to those people who've received the word of God in their hearts, who believe the gospel... It's begun a work in them, the work of sanctification. And the word of God is at work in you who believe, Paul says. It comes inside, it scoops out all the dirt, it shows us who we are, and it shows us where the fountain of cleansing is in Christ. Yes, it's true, many, many people reject the gospel, but for you who believe, the word of God is with you, it is in your heart, and it will continue with you until the end of the age. It's the sword that God uses to scrape out the muck and the filth on the inside of our hearts. All this and more we saw there as Jesus explained the purpose of the word of God. So now as we move into this section of the, of the high priestly prayer, uh, Jesus begins to shift his focus. He was praying for himself in the first part of the prayer. In the second part of the prayer, he's praying for his disciples who are in the upper room with him. In the final part of the prayer, he is praying for those who will become disciples in the future. For you and for me, perhaps even as Jesus prayed this prayer, think of this. Perhaps he even saw our faces as he looked forward to those who'd become disciples in the future. So it's my prayer as we look at these things together today, as we think about uh, the word of God coming to us at the end of the age. I pray we'd look at what does Jesus pray for us? As Jesus thinks about you and me, what are his prayers for us who've come right at the end of days to faith? 
What does he want to see from us as his people? And how can we live in a way which is pleasing to our master? All this is revealed in just these three verses, and we won't even get into everything these three verses have to say. So, so as we look at the passage together, I want to show us two things. At first, I want to show us the call to Christian unity, considering what it means for Jesus to ask the Father for us all to be one. What does that mean? And secondly, we'll consider the results of Christian unity. What will be the effect if we actually come together as one, as God's people, just as Jesus prayed about? So the call to Christian unity and the results of Christian unity. I pray as we look at this together that God lead us into that perfect way of unity and love for one another as believers. And let's look first then together at the call to unity. The call to unity. Well, as many as you... If you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not from New Zealand, I'm from England. And in England, we don't have towns as much as we have villages. Uh, we call a, a little gathering a village, not a town. And um, in Wakefield, the city I'm from, we have a little village called Horbury Bridge. If you blink, you'll miss it. But as you drive through, it has this big sign. And it says, Horbury Bridge, home of onward Christian soldiers. I don't even know that. Uh, familiar with that hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers, Marching Us Toward, Looking Unto Jesus, Who Has Gone Before. Well, that was written in Horbury Bridge. It's the only thing it will ever be famous for. If you want some tires, it's also a good place to get some tires for cheap. But it says, Home of the Onward Christian Soldiers. And um, in that song, it says, We are not divided, all one body we, one in faith and doctrine, one in charity. Let me ask you, is that true? Is it true that the Christian church is not divided, but we are all one body? And that we're all the same in, in doctrine and in charity? Well, whatever you think of that song, the issue of church unity is not something we can avoid, is it? It's something we need to think about. Because here again, in John chapter 17, Jesus is praying for the unity of his people. It's not something we can ignore because this is now the second time Jesus has prayed for this. Look with me at verse 20. Jesus says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's, that's future generations of Christians. And what's Jesus' first prayer in verse 21? That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. As Jesus looks down the corridor of time, he sees his people come into him in the future. He knows everything. He's sovereign over them. And his first prayer is that they might be one. They might be one. wonder how we're doing with that with our over 10,000 denominations in this world. So what does Jesus mean when he says that we all must be one? Is he saying we all have to look the same and dress the same and act the same? Well, plenty of Christians have thought that. Let me tell you a quick story. I met some Romanian Christians and they went on mission to um, somewhere in the North Pole, I believe. I don't know if this is the politically correct term, but the Eskimos were there living in their, in their dwellings. And these Romanians guy all these Romanian Christians started to give the Eskimos a tune-up because they all had, had big beards. And the Romanian Christian said, a real Christian has a nice smooth face. Doesn't have any of this beard stuff. And um, we're going to have to talk about your clothes as well because you're wearing these giant animal skins and you should be wearing a nice suit on the Lord's Day. Is that what Jesus means when he said that he wants us to be one, that we all have to look the same, speak the same, act the same, not at all. Now, Jesus' idea is that we're all one in purpose. There are many cogs, but there is only one machine with one purpose for the glory of God. That's what Jesus wants. He wants us to be one in purpose, one in mission, one in our reason for living. 
He wants us to have such a oneness which it reflects even the Godhead itself. Did you notice what Jesus said there? He said that they may all be one, just as you, Father, in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. He's saying how close we are, Father, how one we are, that's how close I want my people to be. So let's ask a question, and this is nearly a couple of thousand years old, isn't it? Let's ask a question, has Jesus' prayer been answered? Has it been answered? Well, in part, yes, and in part, no. Of course, we're one in Christ. There's only one gospel, but we're still becoming one in practice. So yes, it's been answered, but it's also progressively been answered even today. How's that work? That sounds like a bit of a politician's answer, yes and no. Well, consider the words that Paul says in the book of Corinthians. He he draws attention to our objective oneness, which we have in the gospel. Let me read it to you from the book of Corinthians. Paul says, there is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. In a very real sense, we are all already one, aren't we? We share so much as Christians. There is one, one body, Paul says. One body. And if you wanted to get technical, you could probably divide it into six parts. I won't include the Roman Catholics in this list, and I won't talk about it again. There's a big, a big chunk of sermon on that already. But here are the six branches of the Christian churches you might recognize. Uh, we have the Anglican Church. It's here in New Zealand. It's in England. It's all over the world, isn't it? They have a high view of the sacraments. They do great work in their community. And you have some great theologians coming out of the Anglican Church, such as J.C. Ryle and John Stott. You have the Lutheran Church, also all over the world, also a Christian church. It focuses on grace and the five solas. You have Martin Luther was a Lutheran, the composer Bach was a, 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 a Lutheran, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer was also a Lutheran, a great man who served God in their time. You've got the Anglican Church, the Lutheran Church, you've got the Reformed Church, which we're a part of. Uh, focus on God's sovereignty, his kingship in the world, the preeminence of Christ, the freeness of salvation. You've got John Calvin, George Whitfield, all the Westminster Assembly, all the men who translated the King James Bible were reformed as well. You've got your non-denominational church, which is a big umbrella of churches. And they stress and emphasize the freedom which is to be ours in Christ, that we're not tied to an establishment, but that each individual Christian church has autonomy. There's some great people to come out of the non-denominational church as well. The Anglican, the Lutheran, the Reformed, the non-denominational, and the Pentecostals, the biggest of all the denominations in the world, it has to be acknowledged. They focus on the work of the Spirit in our lives, on having a real religious experience with God. And they've had some great men come through their ranks as well. George Verwer, the owner of Operation Mobilization. Reynard Bonke did some good work in his time. It's the biggest denomination in the world. And then you've got the Greek Orthodox still on the Christian spectrum. They're like smells and bells and strange pictures. But they're still your brothers and sisters in Christ because they believe the same gospel and in the triune God. There is one body with many different parts. But we're all still, still one body. There is the visible church, which you see with your eyes. You can break it up into those six little pieces. And yet ultimately there's only one church, isn't there? The church invisible, Christ church, made up of all the elect from all of time, from every tribe, tongue, and nation. So there's one body, there's also, Paul says, one spirit. You know, there's only one Holy Spirit, isn't there, who opens up your eyes and shows you the gospel of Christ. If we met with some Chinese Christians and they believed in Christ, they would have the same spirit at work in their hearts. 
The same one who puts his finger on our sins is doing it right now in other parts of the world. We have one spirit. The true church has one hope also, Paul says. And we don't hope in our own good works. We don't hope in our denomination and in our religion. We hope in Jesus Christ and his shed blood and his death and his resurrection. There's one body, there's one spirit, there's one hope, there's one Lord. Now, there are many people who claim to be all about Christ, but they don't mean the same thing. T- you know, when we talk about Christ here, we're talking about the second person of the Trinity, fully God, fully man, eternally proceeding from the Father and from, from whom is sent forth the Holy Spirit. One l- true Lord, the triune God. We have one faith. It's, it's with an empty hand that we believe the gospel. We don't come to God trying our best, offering him some sort of other sacrifice. We come through Jesus. One faith, one baptism. Some of us might be into sprinkling, some are into full immersion, but we both believe in the water which represents visible membership in the covenant community. One God and Father who is over all and through all and in all. We have so much in common with other Christians that in a real sense we are already one. Paul says again, it says, in one spirit we're all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of the one Spirit. If you're a Christian, you know that you're a hell deserving sinner, and that Christ has died for you, and that's your only hope of salvation. And if if you have that belief, you're a believer. Doesn't matter what label you've got on you, doesn't matter which church you're a part of, you are in Christ church. We are all already one, and Jesus' prayer has been answered. But there's also here another sense in which it's still being answered, isn't there? The challenge for us now as believers is to become in practice what we already are in reality. What does that mean? How do we become more more one in practice? Well, once again, Paul's helpful in this. He gives us some more instructions. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. It says, I beseech you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that you all speak the same thing and there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. He says, I want all of you to speak the same things. It doesn't mean you need to speak with an English accent, anything like that. It means you need to speak the same truths from the gospel. There needs to be absolute agreement on the fundamental essentials. And you see, the problem is in the modern church is the list of essentials is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. And we're giving up things which we should not give up on. He says, I want you all to speak the same things. You know, if there was a revival in Gisborne, we would all be agreed on the gospel. There would be no compromise on it whatsoever. Everyone would be in agreement. That's what Christ wants, speak the same things. If there was revival and God brought true unity to the church, then there'd be no more divisions, no more silly arguments about things. You know, I've told you this many times before, but I've seen churches split up over, over the nature of the flowers at the front, over silly things like this, silly divisions, silly arguments of, oh, they didn't sing my favorite hymn, now I'm in tears. Well, church isn't about you, it's not about me, it's about one another, isn't it? There'd be no divisions among you. That's what Paul wants, that's what Christ wants for us, that's what he prays for. It's all over the New Testament, isn't it, that we're to be one, we're to be unified, we're to be one people together. It says, in patience, bear with one another in love, Ephesians 4, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of of peace. That's what God wants for us, eager to maintain the unity and the bond of peace. And it's possible, isn't it? Just look at Jesus' disciples, look at the men who are in this room together. There's Simon the the Zealot, he's a religious nutcase in many ways. He would have trained all his life to murder people, to kill them. And then there's Matthew the tax collector, 
the one who was in collusion with Rome? How are you going to get those two men in the same room with each other? There's Matthew, who's a betrayer to his people. There's Simon the Zealot, who's been training to kill betrayers all his life. And here they are on mission together, sat in the upper room, listening to the master saying, you must be one. They were simple fishermen. They were educated men amongst the disciples. And Christ said, you're all brothers and sisters. All of you are one. I'm not saying they always got it right. There was definitely some work to be done, wasn't there, in this area? Do you remember the disciples when they saw another team of people out doing some evangelism, out preaching in Jesus' name? And they said, Master, let's call down the fire on these people because they're not part of our group. That same spirit's around today still, isn't it? They're not part of our little group. We should call down the fire on them. They don't have a right to be doing it. They're not reformed enough. We still hear this sort of talk today when really we should be focusing on the gospel, the absolute essential truths. There's still a lot of work to be done, isn't there, to become in practice what Christ has already made us in principle. There's still a lot of work to be done. This is still being answered. This is why I sometimes speak to the other pastors and say, let's come together and do some evangelism. As long as it's based on the fundamental truths, we have unity. But we're not there yet. We've still got a lot of work to be done, but we should be interested because Christ is interested. It's the first thing that sprung to his mind when he looked down the corridors and saw us coming to him in faith. He said, I'm praying that there be one. And what will the result be if we actually listen to Christ, if we actually start trying to get other Christians on board of us, start trying to encourage our brothers and sisters instead of tearing them down? What will the result be? in our own lives and in the community. Well, it's this that leads to our second point. We've seen the call to Christian unity through Christ. Now let's consider together the result of Christian unity. The result of Christian, Christian unity. Well, in your head you might say, has there ever been a group of Christians who've been able to live together and do it right? Well, I say, look no further than the New Testament itself. What does it say about the believers in the book of Acts? Acts chapter 4, 32. It says, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that the things that belonged to them was his own, but they had everything in common. Almost sounds communist, doesn't it, for a second? But they loved one another. They didn't consider anything their own possessions. It all belonged to everyone. It's a radical community of grace, wasn't it? You had dignitaries like Perpetua living with slaves and high men, low men, Jews, Greeks, slave free, all together in the gospel. And no one said, this is my stuff, you're not having it, I'm just looking after me. No, they all shared and That's how it was in the early church. And what was the result? Let me read it to you. It says, With great power the apostles were given their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold to the land and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. That's challenging stuff, isn't it? People were in need in the church. The rich people said, well, we'll just have to sell the boat. We'll just have to get rid of the second house and we'll have to give it to the poor. Could you imagine what that would look like in in New Zealand? Someone needs something. Okay, it looks like I'm getting rid of the second vehicle. Kiss it goodbye and give it to them. It's only what Christ taught himself, didn't he? If a man asks, asks you for a tunic, give him your cloak as well. It's challenging stuff, but the early church took it very seriously. There wasn't a single person in need among them. It should be the same with us, shouldn't it? It should be a tragedy if someone's in need and doesn't have enough food in our Christian community. But to look after our own first in the household of God and then out into the world. And when we do this, what will the result be? Well, Jesus says, doesn't it? Look at verse 21. When all this is done, the world will believe that you have sent me. 
people know that Christians are God's people when they follow him in this way? He says, is Jesus really telling the truth here? Do people really recognize there's something different about the Christians? I'll just consider these testimonies from church history. At Flavius Josephus, you've probably heard of him, the historian. He was alive from 370 to 100 AD. He said this, he said, The Christian sect has a great influence among the women and the poor, and they are always, always ready to support one another. Tacticus, another Roman historian, said the Christians are devoted to one another and their first instinct was to care for the needy among them. Aristides the Athenian said if one of their number is poor or sick, all the Christians provide for their needs. They love one another and are devoted to one another. And finally, the Emperor Julian the Apostate, he said the impious Galilean Christians support not only their own poor, but also as Julian the Apostle hated the, hated the Christians, but he said they look after each other and they're so gracious they're even looking after our poor community. It's a challenge, isn't it? What will people write about us in the future? Imagine if someone jots down a little bit about Gisborne, 2024, what's the church like here? A challenge, isn't it? They say some of them look like they're too in love with themselves to care about other people. Some of them have hoarded up riches and treasures for themselves. Some of them don't even want to come to church. They just come to save face. Got, we've got a long way to go, haven't we? A long way to go. And we look at these early Christians, how they loved one another, how they cared for one another. It's in this way the world will believe that they're have been sent that Jesus was who he said he was, that his people are who they say they are, that the gospel spreads. I wonder what they'll write about us in 2024, what they'll write about me in Gisborne. But it's this unity, this care for one another, this love for one another, which adorns the gospel, isn't it? What did Jesus say in John 13? By this will all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. If we love one another, if we care for one another, if we do what Christ says, people will realize that we belong to him, that we're a different people, that there's something special about us. And as the psalm says, when brothers dwell together in unity, behold how good and how pleasant it is, for there the Lord commands his blessing. And when you look at history, you really see that, don't you? In the Protestant Reformation in the 1600s. And they got together and they translated the King James Bible. hundred men in one room took them ten years. But they finally did it. They translated the Bible from the Hebrew and the Greek into English. A few years later they got together and said, what does the Bible teach? And we ended up with the Westminster Confession of Faith. There was incredible unity. They considered the Westminster Confession the absolute basics of Christian belief. And the society was transformed, wasn't it? Schools, hospitals, all the blessings which come with Christianity all flourished all over Europe. It was the same in the Evangelical Awakening in the 18th century. You had staunch Calvinists working with Arminians and other people. And their revival efforts transformed the whole of the UK and America. Even the Western world. This is what Christ died for, isn't it? That we might be one and that we might show the world the love that we have for one another. Verse 22, Christ says, The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, so that they may be one, even as we are one. He's saying, I, I died so that my people could be brought together as one people. Paul says it in Ephesians, doesn't he? He says, he's abolished the dividing wall of hostility, abolished the law of commandments that was against us in order to create in himself one new man. One new man. That's what Christ is creating. He wants us to be one. And when we do that, the world will see, the world will be transformed. Verse 23, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. And so the world may know that you sent me and loved them 
even as you love me. As we live this way, as we love one another, people will look at us and say, those are the people that Christ loves. See how they love one another. See how they love him. Where can I get this love for myself? This is one of God's plans for saving the world, isn't it? Of course, we go forward with the word. We go forward weeping with the precious seed. We pray. But we're to love one another all the time as we do these things. In this way, the world will know we're his disciples. The world will know that we are a people bought by him who are one new man. Let's ask some questions as we close today. Well, it's great to come to John 17 again to listen to Jesus praying. Uh, We've got one more sermon on it next week and then we'll be done and into the garden of Gethsemane. It's very clear, isn't it, when you look at this prayer that Jesus cares about the unity of his church. It's no good that we have 10,000 denominations. It's no good that some churches won't work with others because they don't like the hats the ladies wear and this sort of thing. Unity is commanded and unity is possible because we are already actually one. We have the same Lord, the same hope, the same baptism. We are already one in Christ. Let's learn to act like it. Let me ask you today, Is there anything of that spirit about you which says, let's call down fire from heaven on the others? It's been in my heart before. Yeah, what are those guys doing? You know, is there any of that spirit about us? If there is, then we need to repent, don't we? We need to turn from that. And if we do have more knowledge than others, well, how are we using it to bless and encourage them? How are we using it to lift the veil off them, to show them more of the glory of Jesus Christ? Because that's the true test of our knowledge, isn't it? How are we sharing that love, that knowledge with other people? Unity is commanded, but it's also possible because of the gospel. And what a shame when we rip each other to bits in Christ church. Let's learn to love one another just as he has loved us. Let me just close with that reading again from the book of Psalms. Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It's like precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of air and running down the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountain of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. All this unit is possible because of Christ dying for us, isn't it? And you know what sin he also died for on the cross? For a lack of unity. As we talk about this, as we talk about our schism, as we talk about how we're not close enough to other believers, we're already talking about a forgiven sin in the gospel. And so because that sin's forgiven, because it's already put under the blood of Christ, let's go forward and love one another. For there the Lord commands the blessing. Who knows what great things God has in store for Gisborne? As the church has worked together as we agree on the essentials and preach the gospel of grace together. Amen.